Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter number 1. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to continue our series that we began a couple of weeks ago before our revival meeting entitled A New Creature in Christ. And uh, we're going through the physical account of the creation as recorded in Genesis chapter number 1, and we're comparing it and applying it to the spiritual creation of man. It really is amazing when you read Genesis chapter 1 in the early verses of chapter 2, and you compare it with Galatians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which says this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, bless now as I preach in Jesus' name. Amen. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And that word creature there is a created product. It's a manufactured product produced by its owner. And so not only in Genesis chapter 1 through the early verses of chapter 2 do we find that the world, the heavens, and all that is contained within the universe is a created product of the sovereign God of heaven. We find that if any man be in Christ, that means you've got to be saved. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. We looked at day number one, which was the creation of life. And we see the believer's salvation. By the way, you can't be a new creature in Christ if you're not saved. And so we saw through the creation of light, the believer's salvation. But I want you to look in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 6, and I want you to see the second aspect of our new creation in Christ, how God is creating us and forming us into a new creature. Look in verse 6, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it, now if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, will you circle or underline or highlight that word divide? Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided. There's that word again. Would you highlight, circle, underline, make a note? Secondly, that word divided, used again, the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now notice the next statement in verse number 8. And God called the firmament heaven. Now, I want you to observe something. Do you believe every word of God is pure? I do. I don't believe there are any errors in the word of God. I don't believe, certainly, that there were any errors in inspiration. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost of God. I furthermore don't believe in any errors in translation. If there are any mistakes in the translation process, then how can you trust the inspiration process? If God's not God enough to preserve it, is he God enough to give it? But the Bible says in the book of Psalms that the word of God would be purified seven times. The Bible you hold in your lap is the infallible, indestructible, inerrant word of the living God in English. So if you'll observe heaven, you'll notice it's capitalized. That means we're not talking just about the clouds that you fly through when you're in an airplane. But we're talking about heaven. We're talking about a place. Notice this, the firmament he called heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. 
If you were to read the next couple of verses, you would get to verse number 10, and this is day number three, but it's worth mentioning so that we have a fuller understanding of day two. God called the dry land earth, and day three, he's going to form the dry land, and he's going to call that earth. Now, you need to understand that the planet was here. Day number three is the creation of the dry land and the gathering together of the waters. Remember he said in verse number two that the earth was without form and void. Now that word earth, look at it, in verse two is little. Speaking of our planet, speaking of the circumference of our celestial body, he gave the name in verse number 10, earth. By the way, scientists didn't name our planet. God did. Amen. He called the dry land, he called the body of water that makes up our planet, he called it earth. And the Bible says in verse number seven that he divided the waters. He divided the firmament. In other words, there is a heavenly and there is an earthly and God put a division between the two. If that is not a picture, as we consider a new creature in Christ, if that is not a picture of the believer, believer separation, I don't know what is. He divided the waters under the firmament from the waters above the firmament. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20, the Bible says this through Paul, our conversation, that is our behavior, our conduct, our manner of life is in heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want you to take your Bible with me and go to the book of Ephesians, the New Testament book of Ephesians. I want you to read with me for about nine or ten verses here to gain a fuller understanding of the believer's separation. The Bible says in verse one, are you there? Ephesians chapter two, New Testament, verse number one. And you, who's the you? The believers in Ephesus and down through the years, you and I as believers, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That means he made us alive, he quickened us. Wherein time past ye walked, notice this, according to the course of what? This world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we also had our conversation. There's that word again. Now Paul would tell us in Philippians that our conversation, our behavior, our manner of life is in heaven. But prior to getting saved in time past, it was in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. David said in sin. Did my mother conceive me? We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Aren't you glad he loved you when you were a sinner? Yeah. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved hath raised us up together and made us sit, notice this, together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now the Bible says in verse 3, our conversation, our conversation was according to the course of this world. But the Bible says in verse 6, upon salvation, he gave us a seat in heaven. Notice verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. Now let me stop right here. The fact that you're a new creature in Christ, you have nothing to boast about in yourself, but you, the Bible says in the next verse, are his workmanship. Amen. Notice this, created. See that word? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So in day number two, it's obvious we have been made to sit in heavenly places. We used to live according to the course of this world, but upon getting saved by the grace of God, there's a dividing line between heaven and earth. Don't you see that? Now, Paul said this to the Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Now, before I read this verse, let me remind you, there is a positional sanctification of the believer. That is immediate. The moment you got saved, you were set apart unto God. You were adopted into the family of God. Hebrews chapter number 10 makes that perfectly clear. In fact, in day number one, the believer's salvation, you see he divided the light from the darkness the saint from the sinner. You are no longer a child of your father, the devil, but praise God, you're a child of the king. That happened the moment instantaneous you got saved. There is a permanent sanctification, praise God, one day that's coming. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53, that this corruptible must put on incorruption. You and I are saved by the grace of God. We're still filthy, vile, wretched, saved sinners. Amen. Right, amen. But as the songwriter said, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. You and I are still robed in a body of sinful flesh. But as the songwriter also said, one day this robe of flesh shall drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize. Amen. What are you saying, Brother Sam? There's a permanent day coming when you'll never think any evil, you'll never say any evil, you'll never look at any evil. You will be permanently rescued from this flesh. Amen. That'll be a great day, won't it? Amen. But between the positional, Brother Foster, and the permanent, is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, where the Bible says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That is progressive sanctification, continual, daily. Didn't Paul say, I die daily? That's what he said. For me to live is Christ. That's what he said. So you were positionally sanctified, set apart, light from darkness, the moment you got saved. But every day that you live, you ought to be drawing closer to God and further from the world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, you're going to see him by way of the grave. Or you're going to see him in the clouds. And then you'll be permanently sanctified. I'm trying to tell you tonight in Evansville, Indiana, it's the will of God. The will of God. That the child of God be sanctified and separated meat for the master's use. You need to understand something. Separation's not a dirty word. And just because some take the doctrine of separation and turn it, turn it, turn it into something that the Bible never intended for it to be, which is legalism. Now, come on, I'm preaching it right. There it is one thing to be separated unto God. It's another thing to teach that your separation saves you. Right, amen. Because it doesn't. Right. If that's the case, then Lot was lost. But the Bible said that he was a just man. Guarantee you he's in heaven, yet so as by fire. Don't take separation where God never intended for it to go. Do you remember how the disciples, not the disciples, excuse me, but the Pharisees in the New Testament 
were always accusing Jesus of violating the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He never violated anything. What he was violating was their interpretation of the Sabbath. Amen. Don't take the commands of God where the commands of God don't go. But just because some take it where they should not go does not mean we're not supposed to be separated. I really am. I want you to look, Brother Sam, and listen. I'm tired of this Christian mentality that because some take separation further than it needs to go, then we need to just do away with separation altogether. You look at me and listen. It's the will of God. Don't you want to be in His perfect will? It's the will of God that the heaven and the earth in your life be divided. Amen. That's the truth, Brother Jason. It is the Bible truth. He divided the heaven from the earth. Now with that in mind, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at a chapter in the Bible that a good number of God's people wish wasn't in there. <laughs> Y'all like my sermon a few weeks ago on a new country talked about heaven. Everyone shouted me down. I wonder how you're going to feel tonight. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter number six. Verse number 14. We're going to talk about separation quickly tonight. Be ye not. Now I'm just going to stop right there and, and ask anybody with a fifth grade education, is that in the old King James too hard to understand? <laughs> Be ye not. Sounds simple to me. Easy to understand. Be ye not what? Brother Paul, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? After that statement, he then asked through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he asked a series of questions, and we're going to answer them tonight. I was taught in grammar school that questions demand and deserve answers. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is none. What communion hath light with darkness? The answer is none. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What's the answer, church? None. none. Man, you all are doing good passing the exam. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What's the answer? None. Boy, you all are doing great. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? None. none. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. And I want you to see the life verse of every New Testament believer. Your favorite Bible scripture, wherefore come out from among them. I've never seen that on a tombstone. <laughs> Have you, Brother Joe? I've never seen that. You were talk, talking about the songwriter having that on. I've never seen anyone put, <laughs> bless God, my life verse is come out from among them and be ye separate. Sayeth the Lord and touch not the unclean thing. And I'll receive you. And I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now let's go through this quickly. We're talking about separation. We're talking about day number two, the believer and their separation, a new creature in Christ. He divided the heaven from the earth. Number one, clearly. Upon getting saved, your associations are divided. Notice in verse number 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now you need to remember that 2 Corinthians was written by a Jew, the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians was written not a long time, but just a short time after the earthly ministry of Jesus. He's writing to Jewish folks. 
He's writing to Gentile folks. He's writing to farming folks. So God has him use a word there. Notice it. Yoked. 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 Have you heard of a team of oxen yoked to plow the field? Now, I want your mind to go back to the law. So as Paul, under inspiration, is using this thought, those he was talking to would know immediately what he meant. Because in Deuteronomy 22, the Bible says in the law, thou shalt not plow an ox and an ass. It was against the law to plow, Brother Curvis, with an ox and with an ass. Do you know why that is? Because an ox was a clean beast and an ass was an unclean beast. And therefore, a clean beast and an unclean beast had no business walking on the same path. A couple amens. I appreciate the support. I'm trying to say there is no association in the Word of God that allows the clean and the unclean to tread the same path. Amen. Associations. Notice he would say in verse 15, what concord or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now that word infidel doesn't mean atheist. It doesn't even mean God hater. It just means God denier. It just means unbeliever. So what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, an unbeliever? None. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. God divided the day you got saved, yours and my associations. Amen. Now let me say something to you. That doesn't mean you're not to be friendly to the unsaved. Right. Nor does it mean that it's against God to have friends that are unsaved. That means Jesus was in sin, if that's the case, because he was a friend of publicans and sinners. Amen. But it does mean that your close, intimate associations ought to be, look at me, in the family. Two can't walk together except they be agreed, Brother Jason. The yeah. ox and the ass, they can't walk together. They're not in agreement. One's clean and one's unclean. Now let Brother Sam be the bad guy. It's sin for the saved and the unsaved to marry. I, I, don't, I don't even have to discuss that with you. You young men, one day maybe you'll ask to have an appointment with me and discuss your future as you get older. I'm going to tell you right now, you can come in my office with a young lady and ask to talk to me all you want to, but my first thing is finding out if both of you have a right to be in the same yoke. You better make sure it's yes, because if it's not, the conversation's over. You'll have to go to the justice of the peace. I'm not violating the Bible. Are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. The saved or the unsaved don't get married. Let me say this. Oh, this is real fun. I don't believe a believer and an unbeliever ought to go into business together. Right. First of all, first of all, you're the ox, they're the ass, clean and unclean. That means when you get in the yoke, you're supposed to be plowing together. So you're going to start plowing a clean path and what do you do when you go to your associate and say, all right, we need to write out this month's profit type? What do you mean? Well, we've got to tithe off our business. Well, you're not doing that. Got a problem right off the bat? Yeah. Well, we're, we're not operating with this company. We're not doing work for them. Well, we are doing work for them. Got a problem. The ox and the ass can't plow together. Let me tell you something right now. It, it's, a, it's a good concept to try to think. It's wishful thinking, if I could use that vernacular, to think that you'll be the strong one in the relationship or the friendship or the business association and you'll be able to pull them to see the light. That's not what's going to happen. They'll pull you down. Amen. Right. Now, I want to give you an illustration. Can I do that? This is from Charles Spurgeon. All right? Christopher, I need you to come here just a minute. All right? 
Now, when I do this illustration, it's going to seem a little weird, but it's only, it's just for the sake of, of illustration, so go with it, okay? Because the minute I make this next comment, everyone's going to look at Christopher and he's going to get all red. See, Brother Spurgeon had a young lady walk into his office one day and said, can I talk to you? And he said, yeah. And he said, she said, well, I'm in this relationship with this boy I met at school and I want to get married. I want your blessing and you to officiate the ceremony. True story. He began to inquire like I just preached. Is this a converted boy? Is this a saved boy? By the way, can I? Mm, Baptist Mary Baptist. I said Baptist Mary Baptist. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Brother Sam, that's pretty narrow. Yep, pretty narrow. Amen. I'm not saying Baptists are the only ones going to heaven. But I am saying there is a right doctrine and there is a wrong doctrine. Well, that went over real well, so I better move on. <laughs> Miss Debbie writes the payroll for Sunday before Sunday. I'm glad she did that this week. All right. Now, young lady came in and said, I, I want to get married. This is exactly what he did. He stood up and invited the young lady to his desk chair and said, now I want you to stand on my chair and then stand on my desk. So stand on my desk. This is a true story. And without thinking, Brother Spurgeon said this. He said, uh, you're saved and he's not. Yes, sir. But I, but I can win him. He said, okay, take my hand. Now pull me on the desk. Mm -hmm. Stop. He said, but I can do this. All right. Thank you. Isn't that a good illustration? Exactly. Your associations are divided. Be friendly for crying out loud. It, uh, separation doesn't give you a right to be a jerk. Right. Yeah. Amen. Right. It doesn't give you a right to be a jerk. They need friends that'll bring them to salvation. I'm talking about associations. Amen. Associates. Mm -hmm. It's a difference between an acquaintance and an associate. Amen. Like I said, this isn't on everyone's tombstone. This isn't your life verse because that gets pretty narrow. <laughs> There's no part with the believer and an infidel. Uh, there's not to be a yoking of believers and unbelievers. There's a dividing of associations. According to the word of God, look in verse number 14. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What's the answer, church? None. None. Look, if you will, in verse number 15. What communion hath light with, or verse 14, what communion hath light with darkness? What's the answer, church? None. There's a division of our activities. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Now, here's what Paul said to the church at Ephesus. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. I like the language of my Bible. Pharisees bug me. Always nitpicking, Brother Curvis. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? I like how God just said, all oh, uncleanness. <laughs> <clears throat> Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness. Now notice, let it not once be named among you. It's a bad testimony if you're linked to the former. Amen. There has been a division of our activities. Now remember in day number one, the believer's salvation, the Bible said he divided the light from the dark. Now, remember, take your mind back to the book of John. Can you do that? Chapter number three, maybe that will help you. So you understand the context now is Jesus with Nicodemus. 
And he's telling him that he must be born again to be saved and to see the kingdom of heaven. He then, as he's talking about sin, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He came not into the world to condemn the world. Why is that, Brother Sam? Already condemned. He didn't come to the world to condemn the world. He came to save from the condemnation that man already had. And then he says this. He said something you need to understand, Nicodemus, is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I believe what Jesus is trying to say, he's saying, I know why you came to me by night. Now, he's not saying what Nicodemus was doing was evil. He's saying you don't want to be seen, so you're covering your tracks in darkness. In this particular case, Brother Jason, he's afraid of the pharisaical backlash. And so he didn't come to Jesus at noon. He came to Jesus at night when no one could see him. And he said, let's take, this, let's take what you've just done, Nicodemus. You came secretly in the night, and let's apply it to your spiritual problem, which is you love darkness rather than light because your deeds are evil. And then he says this, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. You know why bars are more dark than they are light? Hide what's going on on the inside. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. <clears throat> Beholding the evil and the good. Your activities have been divided. They've been divided. <clears throat> you don't party like you used to. You don't jam like you used to. You don't look at what you used to. You don't talk how you used to. You don't dress how you used to. You don't behave how you used to. Yeah. Heaven and earth has been divided. Number three. Look in verse 15. What concord? That means unity, harmony. Hath Christ with Belial. What's the answer, church? Uh, your ambitions have been separated. That means you're not living for your own ambitions. You're living for him now. And your goals and your desires and your avenue for success hinges on not what is successful to you in what you want, but that you're going to be successful as a believer by fulfilling what he wants. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, that no man can serve two masters. I wish we understood that. I wish we didn't just know it in our head, but we understood it in our heart. Because even though you're sitting at the Landmark Baptist Church on a Sunday evening, does not mean there aren't some of us in this auditorium attempting to serve too. It can't be done. You can't serve God with the right hand and hold on to the world with the left hand. Amen. He said you'll either hate the one and love the other. He said, you'll cling to the one or you'll despise the other. He said, no, no, uh, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means material. He's trying to say, you can't put treasures in heaven and build treasures on earth. That does not mean you can't be wealthy. It means you don't live to be wealthy. It doesn't mean you can't have a nice home. It's just this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Amen. Amen. God giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. There's nothing wrong with having. The problem is with what you have has you. That's right. the problem. That's right. In Joshua chapter number 24 and verse number 15, the famous uh, challenge by Joshua he said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now that may seem like an interesting statement, but sadly it's a true statement. There are some that claim to be saved and claim the name of Christ and they consider it a waste to serve the Lord. They consider it evil. I never will forget. I was a teenage boy. I can remember it as if it happened tonight. 
My grandparents were visiting. My grandparents, my grandfather was unsaved. He's passed away. Sadly, my grandmother's unsaved. My dad wasn't raised in a Christian home. My dad was in the United States Navy from 1970 to 1985. My dad didn't retire from the Navy. My dad resigned so that he could fulfill the call of God in his life to preach. My grandfather never forgave him for that. And I remember a very deep conversation, loud conversation, contentious conversation that at my very own dining table, the Crab Orchard House, Wendy, my grandfather reamed my dad over the coals, said, you're an idiot. That I don't care that you're a preacher. I care that you threw your life away for five years. Why couldn't you have preached after you retired? It's evil to my grandfather, for my dad, not serve mammon, but to serve the master. <clears throat> Choose you this day, he said, whom you'll serve. You've got to make a decision. This day, you're deciding. Even right now at the Landmark Baptist Church, you're deciding, I'm serving the master or I'm serving mammon. Choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood. In other words, go back to the life you used to have, the money you used to enjoy and make. Or he said this, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. There's a division in your ambitions. If you want to be, be that new creature in Christ, if you want to draw nigh to God, then you've got to draw further from your wishes, ambitions, and desires. In other words, your life, as the songwriter penned, my life, Lord, is yours to control. Tom Williams and his wife that got ill, I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine, rich treasures to find. Give wisdom the choices I make along every path that I take. So when I complete life's race, well done, you will say. By the way, you won't hear well done if you ain't done well. Oh, every believer will hear welcome home. But not everyone will hear well done. There's been a division, Brother Jason, of our ambitions. I'm saying heaven and the high calling of God and earth have been divided. The song we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And let me close. Look in verse number 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What's the answer, church? Thank you, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they shall be my people. There's two things I want you to consider. Two points under this one verse because they follow the one from the other. Number one, affection. Your affection has been divided. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Remember he said you can't serve God and mammon. You'll love the one or hate the other. Your affection has been desired. In other words, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. He said, but in Luke 10, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. Your affection has been divided. When your affection is divided, your adoration will be divided. Your worship should be divided. What does a songwriter say, Brother Jason? I boast not of earth, nor tell of good deeds, for not have I done the merit his grace. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. I was so unworthy, but he died. I play. Jeremiah said, let not the mighty man glory in his strength. 
He said, let not the wise man glory in his mind. He said, let not the uh, strong man glory in his strength. He said, but I'll glory at the cross. Let me tell you something, friend. You're living for him. You're not living for this world. And your adoration is in the temple, not on idols. Did you know long before you, when you look at the Ten Commandments, God's a God of order, isn't he? Which means, in my opinion, all Ten Commandments are as he wanted them. And what's the very first commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Now before he ever said you're not to take unto thee any graven images, and before he said you're not to bow down to any other God, he said you've got to love me. And you look at Brother Sam and listen, you'll never, never, never adore the one you're not affectionate to. What are you saying, Brother Sam? I'm saying if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. <clears throat> your affection and your adoration and your desires were divided. Your look now was to the heavenly, not on the earthly. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. It's the will of God that every saved believer be a separated believer. Our associations are divided. Our activities, they're divided. Our ambitions, divided. Our affection, divided. Our adoration, divided. In day number two, he separated and divided the firmament from above, from the firmament beneath. He called it heaven, and in day three, he called it earth. Heaven and earth are divided. That's the will of God. Heavens are bowed, eyes are closed.